Yes. Well, thank you all very much for coming here. My name is Richard Pito. I shall be chairing this, and this is a student society debate. And here we have Roy and Nessa, who are going to explain about the student society, the debate, life, the universe, and everything. I don't know if this. Okay, good. This is on. So um, we're not really going to talk about life and the universe, but uh, the rest of it we will talk about it. So again, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the debate of the ages, organised by the Oxford University Scientific Society. I'm Nessa. And I'm Roy. Uh, we represent the Oxford University Scientific Society, which is the oldest scientific society in the world. Our society's main goal is the public dissemination of scientific information. But our society belongs to the city of Oxford, not just the university. So events like this are open to everyone and designed to engage everybody. In order to fund these scientific public engagement events, we, we uh, depend on your generosity. So please donate to our society, um, your society, at the end of this debate. The proposed motion tonight is, this house wants to defeat ageing entirely. Our initial analysis of the registration database shows that 25% of you support this motion and therefore side with Dr. Aubrey Gray. 35% of you oppose this motion and therefore side with Professor Colin Blakemore. And 40% of you are neutral. Tonight's debate is being chaired by Professor Sir Richard Piso. He is Professor of Medical Statistics and Epidemiology at the University of Oxford and Director of the Clinical Trial Service Unit. His work has included studies of the causes of cancer, particularly the effects of smoking, and the establishment of large-scale randomised trials. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1989 and was knighted in 1999 for services to epidemiology and to cancer prevention. So finally, before we begin with the exciting night of science, I'm going to give you just a short description of the debate program. So the first five to ten minutes, uh, Professor Sir Richard Pito will introduce the topic at hand, and he will also introduce Professor Colin Blakemore and Dr. Robert Gray. Then, for the next 15 minutes, Dr. Robert Gray will speak for the motion, followed by Professor Colin Blakemore speaking for 15 minutes against the motion. This will be followed with a 15-minute Q&A session directed by Sir Richard. At the end of that, there's a 30-minute session where all of you can ask any question you want to uh, directed at Professor Colin Blakemore or Dr. Robert Gray. At the end of that 30-minute session, there'll be a five-minute repost and summary by both Robert Gray and then Professor Colin Blakemore. At the end of that, there will be just five minutes closing remarks by Sir Richard, and that will be the end. May I now welcome Sir Richard to commence the debate. Well, first, if you've got a mobile phone, then turn it off, otherwise you will not do any more ageing. Um, Basically, it's a very odd thing that people age in the way they do. And there's all sorts of ways that evolution could have avoided it happening. You know, women become a bit less fertile in their 40s and then have the menopause. Well, it would be easy to have a mutation, a few mutations that made that not happen. And then they'd go on having more kids and that would be selected for. So why doesn't it happen? You know, having taken all the trouble to make a body, why let the thing age? I mean, it's, it's almost as though evolution seems to have chosen this strategy of, you know, first make them young and then kill them off. And it, the extent to which this happens is quite extraordinary. If you take a lot of types of cancer, then if you compare 20-year-olds with 80-year-olds and say, what's the chances you're going to get cancer tomorrow? Then it's about a thousand times big in an 80-year-old. Well, why? I mean, it seems very odd, and many other diseases as well are vastly more common, at least the degenerative diseases, if you like, the non-communicable diseases, they're vastly more common in the old than in the young. Why? And it, it's, it's odd. And 60 years ago, it, there were papers written by Richard Doll, among others, um, on multi-stage models, which pointed out that 
if you if actually the cellular processes that culminate in cancer are nothing to do with age then if you if they just happen at the same rate in old cells and in young cells you could still finish up with cancer being a thousand times more common in the old than in the young because you know, if, say, compare an 80-year-old with a 20-year-old, then each of those changes has had four times as long to happen. And if there's, say, half a dozen such changes, well, you know, four to the power six gets up, gets you up to something like a thousand. So it could be that you just need several changes to fall to bits, and just if you're twice as old, you've had twice as long to have them. If you're four times as old, you've had four times as long to have them. So you can get disease being much common in old age, with nothing that you should really call ageing um, underlying this. And, you know, experiments have been done with animals where you start exposing them to carcinogens at different ages, and there doesn't seem to be any particular greater susceptibility among the old and among the young. And if you smoke from 20 to 40, and then you say, what's your chances of getting lung cancer at 41? Or if you smoke from 40 to 60, and you say, what's your extra chance of getting lung cancer at 61? They're not very different. So you can get things that, where the disease depends strongly on duration of exposure. And of course, generally, old people have had a longer duration of exposure. So it doesn't have to be anything called aging. And yet that's a somehow unsatisfactory explanation. You know, cancer rates go up steeply with time in mice. They go up steeply with time in men. And after about two and a half years, mice have got a few percent chance of getting a cancer. Well, every little bit of me that was the size of a max had got a few percent chance of having a cancer in two and a half years. I'd be riddled with cancer by the time I was two and a half. And by the time I've got to be, I don't know, 68, 69 next month, actually, then, you know, I'd, I'd probably have about a million or a billion cancers would have arisen. And so, when, how has evolution achieved this? How does it get human cells to actually do this so much more slowly than animal cells? There's something there awaiting discovery. And it's being investigated and I think the investigations vary from Aubrey, who is extremely optimistic that we're actually quite close to it, and who believes that the first person to live to a thousand has already been born. In fact, I think Colin calculated the first person to live to a thousand must already be 68, um, because you said something like eight years ago that they'd, um, they were already 60. And Colin is absolutely certain that Colin is not the person who's going to live to indefinite old age. And so let us hear their reasons. Aubrey de Grey. Aubrey is the director of, now, I've got to get this right. Now you can introduce your institute itself. Um, it's, it's for engineered negligible senescence. So, so studying how to get engineered negligible senescence. Um, trying to change things. And Colin's just trying to study things the way they are here in Oxford. So go ahead. <laughs> Aubrey de Grey. Well, well, thank you very much, Richard, for that excellent introduction, and thank you all for coming. I am delighted that so many people have found this topic to be so interesting as to take time out of their evening. Um, uh, but, of course, I only have now 15 minutes to make the case that uh, we ought to defeat ageing entirely, which is a pretty challenging time limit, so I'm going to dive straight in. Um, I'm going to start by highlighting and analysing, one at a time, three individual words in the motion. First of all, ageing, then once, and then entirely. Um, starting with ageing. Uh, so Richard has just given an interesting and very eloquent uh, description of why it may actually be doubtful that there actually is anything called ageing. However, I would say that this is, in some sense, a matter of terminology. It seems to me that the accumulation of progressive molecular and cellular changes to the composition of the body as side effects of the body's normal operation can be described as ageing, and indeed is appropriately described that way, whereas the phenomenon that Richard was explaining may, at least in some cases, not actually occur, is more of whether there is a positive feedback loop in ageing. In other words, whether ageing speeds up as it, as it progresses. Now, I think that in some areas of ageing, there is evidence for such positive feedback. In others, that evidence may be more fragile. So I think that's an interesting area of research. But I'm going to take the broader definition of ageing as simply the lifelong accumulation of these side effects of 
the normal operation of the human body that eventually contribute to age-related diseases and disabilities by virtue of the fact that the body is only set up to tolerate a certain quantity of that progressive change, that I'm going to call that change damage, and not an indefinite amount of that change. Now, this definition of ageing as the lifelong eventual cause of age-related ill health brings me to a point that I'm going to come back to repeatedly over the next 15 minutes, Namely that actually the whole topic of attempting to defeat ageing with medicine is all about health. It's not about longevity. It's not about longevity. Benefits that might occur as a result of the successful intervention in ageing in terms of the extension of longevity would be side benefits. And really, this is a way of highlighting the fact that the, the idea of intervening in ageing as a medical goal is no different, really, from any other medical goal except in degree. So far, medicine has had a number of good successes which have had only a modest impact in how long people live. Certainly today, when we are trying to push back the diseases of old age, the impact has been very modest so far. And it may be that if we can completely defeat ageing, the impact on longevity would be much bigger. But it's still simply what medicine is all about. It's extending health and thereby, as a side effect, extending longevity. So that's a very important point, I think, that everyone needs to grasp. So now, let me get on to the word wants. Now, the scientific society would not come here to debate a motion that said, this house wants to develop perpetual motion machines. And the reason it wouldn't is because it's not coherent to actually want something unless there is some reason to believe that one could achieve it. One might not know that one could achieve it, but one thinks that it's actually a plausible goal. So even though the motion is ostensibly focused on the desirability of defeating ageing, it, it does incorporate also the feasibility. And I think that all of you here, especially since this is a scientific society, will be interested in knowing more about that. So I'm going to spend a few moments on that. The thing about the feasibility of defeating ageing is that it's, it changes with the advent of new technologies. Many people would say, would have said, at least 10 years ago anyway, and certainly longer ago, that defeating ageing, or even substantially postponing ageing, age-related ill health, by, let's say, a few decades, was highly implausible. But, you know, supposing that you were speaking in 1900 about the feasibility of crossing the Atlantic in less than a day, and the idea that one might be able to do that only 30 years hence, you know, people would have said that was preposterous if they had made the mistake of extrapolating from the rate of progress of speed of ocean-going liners. It just so happened that completely different technology became applicable to that question, that challenge, and sure enough, made it possible to traverse the Atlantic in a very much, more, a very much less time than previously. The analog today for aging comes down to two words, regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is all about restoring the function of the body by restoring its structure to how it was before it had suffered some kind of damage. And we mainly think of regenerative medicine as focused on acute injury like spinal cord trauma or whatever, but it can certainly, in principle, be equally applied to the gradual accumulating damage that we see in aging. And regenerative medicine has made enormous, immense, breathtaking strides over the past decade. That is what led me a decade or so ago to realize that we might actually be within striking distance of bringing aging under genuine medical control, the same sort of medical control that we have today in relation to most infectious diseases. Now, that was a bit of a hard sell early on because regenerative medicine researchers and aging researchers didn't talk to each other very much back then, but now it's not like that anymore. It's no accident that the foundation that's been created around my work has a scientific advisory board of 20-odd extremely prestigious researchers who are willing to associate themselves with the concept that regenerative medicine has a fighting chance against aging. 
It's no accident that I regularly now get asked to organize entire sessions at mainstream gerontology meetings, when five years ago I'd never even been asked to give a talk at such a meeting, despite my reasonably high profile in the wider world. This is no longer a preposterous, radical, heretical idea. This is an idea which those in the field have been exposed to in enough detail to know that it is actually something that needs to be taken seriously as a plausible alternative. So now I'm going to move on to the third word, the word entirely. A lot of people misunderstand this when they see abbreviated um, accounts of what I say and what I've written. People seem to think that I am saying that within the next few decades, we have a very good chance, let's say a 50-50 chance, of developing medicine that can actually completely repair all of the various types of molecular and cellular damage that constitute human aging, and thereby extend longevity indefinitely by periodic application of that repair. Some people, who are even more callous, say that I, I think we can cure aging. In other words, actually develop a one-off treatment that would make people non-aging. And I certainly don't say that and never have. I also, however, have never said that we can develop perfect regenerative medicine against aging in the foreseeable future. However, what I do think is very likely is that within the next few decades, we will generate regenerative medicine that can buy us a few decades of time. In other words, can take people who are already in middle age, let's say 60, and fix them up well enough that they won't be biologically 60 again until they're chronologically 90. The time that we buy then will be used to improve the comprehensiveness of those therapies so that we can re-rejuvenate people one more time and one more time. And I believe that we are in, a, we will have a very good chance of staying one step ahead of the problem indefinitely so that longevity can be increased indefinitely as, again, a side effect of postponing ill health of aging indefinitely. This is an incremental approach, but it's an approach that has the same fundamental outcome as a complete elimination of aging starting from square one. So that is why I talk about the entire defeat of aging. And furthermore, that is why this is so much more plausible than it would be if we were talking only about slowing aging down rather than about genuine repair, genuine preventative maintenance. We have to understand that this is fundamentally preventative maintenance. It's preventative geriatrics, preventative medicine for the diseases and disabilities of old age. Ultimately, there's a big obvious reason why geriatric medicine is so ineffective, why the diseases of old age have been so refractory to medical intervention. It's because they are caused by something that's accumulating by these initially harmless molecular and cellular changes. And therefore, it's a losing battle. It's a downward spiral. We cannot expect to have much success treating the diseases of old age in the way that we would treat a standard infectious disease. All right, so that's set the stage. Now I want to say something about responsibility. A number of scientists have accused me of irresponsibility in talking about the prospective longevity benefits that might accrue from applying regenerative medicine to the problems of aging, uh, because they feel that these predictions are preposterous, and therefore that they are distracting, inappropriately, attention of the public and of policymakers and funders and so on, from the serious business of getting on and actually addressing the diseases of old age that are so prevalent in today's society. But hang on, who is actually the irresponsible one? That rather depends on the science, doesn't it? Because if I were right about the plausibility and indeed the promise of developing medicines against the diseases of old age that really work, that push back those diseases of old age and all the disabilities of old age by much more than any other approach has any chance of doing anytime soon, then surely it is the critics of this approach who are being irresponsible in over-hasty dismissal and ridicule of these ideas. And I had exactly this sort of battle in the gerontology community maybe six or eight years ago in the US, and I'm very pleased to say, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that that battle has essentially been won, and this approach is now taken seriously. I'm delighted that I now have the opportunity to discuss all of this in the UK in a similar manner, and of course I'm hoping that the outcome will be similar. But that leads us now to the essence of this debate, the desirability question. Because, of course, it's fine, in some sense, to dismiss a 
radical technological proposal, even if one's scientific reasons for doing so are completely inadmissible, if the result of success in that, in implementing that technological proposal, would be undesirable. If we actually don't want to cure aging, to defeat aging, then let's just ridicule the idea of doing so. It makes sense. So, let's think about that. I've pointed out now a couple of times that this is all about health. Now think about that for a moment. If you oppose this motion, in other words, if you're thinking that it, you don't want to defeat aging entirely, then you must be holding one of two positions. Either there is some age at which you think it is good for people to get sick, or there is some age at which you think it is good for people to die even if they're perfectly healthy. Think about that. Now, which of those positions does anyone in the audience hold who actually thinks they're against the motion? Think about that before Q&A. Because the fact is, they both sound pretty ageist, don't they? They don't sound like the, the, the ideal, the modern ideal of, of treating old people as if they were people too. I mean, you know, I've never run the Samaritans, but I'm fairly sure that when you do so, the first thing they ask you is not your date of birth so that they can put the phone down if you're over 85. You know, <laughs> the fact is, we do regard old, old people as people too, and the only reason that we regard medicine for old people in a different way than medicine for young people today is because of the practicalities, the fact that we don't have good medicine for old people today. That is not an argument for not developing that medicine. Now, of course, one could try and finesse this. One could try and get out of it by saying, well, okay, what does it actually mean to be sick? You know, there are some people who are 90 and they're pretty healthy. But are they? Maybe they don't have the diseases of old age, the specific ones like Alzheimer's and cancer and cardiovascular disease. But can they keep up with their granddaughters on the dance floor? I don't think so. The fact is, being healthy is not just about not having the things that medics give names to. It's about all of the aspects of decline of function that go with having been born a long time ago. So finally, let's stand back from all this and say, well, what is left for people who oppose this motion? There's only really one opportunity, is to take it head on and say, okay, historically, medicine has been good for everybody. Historically, yes, you know, 150 years ago when we discovered that hygiene was a good idea and was going to save a lot of infant lives, we did not take the view that we should actually conceal this information until everybody had agreed to use contraception, right? And we think it's good that we didn't conceal the information. We think it's good that we got that out there. But maybe in the future, the impact of this particular advance in medicine that we're talking about might be so ghastly that maybe medicine isn't such an allied good thing after all. So let's look at that question in detail. And the thing that I want to say about it is to focus on uncertainty. Many people, when, we talk about this, when I talk about this question, they say, oh dear, won't we have too many people? You know, won't we have a, a dramatic decline in the death rate, people carrying on being born, far too many people, massive environmental problems, don't want to go there. Maybe. Maybe we will. But maybe we won't. We know nothing about what the birth rate is going to be 100 years from now or 50 years from now. We know nothing about what age the average woman is going to have their children, which of course has an enormous impact on the trajectory of global population. We know nothing at all about other technologies that may reduce our carbon footprint and thereby increase the carrying capacity of the planet, thereby eliminating the problem in another way. And the fact that we know nothing about these things is all we need to focus on in acknowledging that we have a clear and present moral obligation today to develop these technologies. Some people talk about the precautionary principle. They say, let's not develop technologies that would be bad. But here's the precautionary principle in relation to the defeat of aging. The scenario that we should be avoiding is a scenario in which humanity of the future looks back and blames us for not developing medicines against aging and thereby for condemning them to an unnecessarily miserable old age and an unnecessarily early death just because we thought we were so clever about how the world was going to be and we thought that it was actually doing them a favour not to develop these medicines. That's the position I don't want to be in. I do not want to be blamed by our descendants and I don't think you do either. Thank you very much. <laughs>
What I should have said, incidentally, is that at the end of all this, when we come to it, it's certainly not possible to get us out through one lot of doors saying eyes and another lot of doors saying noes, and then the abstainers go that way. And so I'm going to ask for a show of hands, and I shall be the one who judges what percentage say aye and what percentage say no. I might even ask for abstainers as well. But um, that's the, going to be the procedure at the end. Whatever percentage I say it is, is what it is. Um, now, in your talk, you said that part of the question is, is this actually going to be practicable? That this is an implicit thing. We're not trying to debate whether or not this has would like perpetual motion machines. And as I understand it, this is one of the subjects which Professor Blakemore is going to speak on. So Professor Colin Blakemore. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Aubrey, for your introduction. Thank you for coming to this meeting. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak to this group. I have to make a confession. I'm, unlike Aubrey, I'm not an expert in the uh, field of um, ageing, though like um, Aubrey, uh, I do have um, views beyond my expertise. In, <laughs> in um, Han Christian Andersen's fairy tale, the little mermaid wins not just um, a pair of legs, but the chance of eternal life if she can secure a human soul. What the sanitised Disney version doesn't tell you is that the other half of the deal was losing her tongue and suffering perpetual pain. What Aubrey de Grey is offering you is eternal life without the pain. This is snake oil, and dangerous snake oil. There are two main reasons why you should reject the idea of defeating ageing completely. First, the mission is utterly unrealistic and is a distraction from the hard and costly task of of preventing and curing disease, whatever the age at which the disease happens. Secondly, if this miracle should somehow happen, the consequences would be a disaster for humanity and for the planet. Let's be clear about what Aubrey's agenda is, what gets him headlines and what raises money for his foundation. It is immortality. In a lecture in Oxford last September, he said, I don't work on longevity, I work on health, and that's what he said, of course, this evening. But he established wait for it, the Methuselah Foundation, which offers enormous prizes for researchers who extend the lifespan of mice. Why is the image on the annual report of his current Sense Foundation a photograph of a NASA rocket? Could it have something to do with his prediction that within 25 years we'll reach what he calls longevity escape velocity, when the gain in life expectancy is more than one year for each year of research? As early as 2004, he wrote a piece for the BBC News Channel website entitled, We Will Be Able to Live to 1000. In that article, he said, I think the first person to live to 1000 might be 60 already. And as Richard said, that was in 2004, so that lucky person's 68 now, Aubrey, and still waiting. In 2009, in the BBC programme, It's Only a Theory, he argued that the first again, that the first 1,000-year-old human had already been born. And last, uh, last uh, month, in Lunt's World blog, he was quoted as saying, given sufficient funding, we shall have a 50-50 chance of completely stopping people from dying of old age within about 25 or 30 years from now. Just on the basis of what he says then, very publicly, I think that it would be reasonable to conclude that Aubrey would, would uh, interpret defeating ageing completely to mean a massive extension of life expectancy. Okay. Maybe part of this bias in presentation is a problem of the, of the media. Maybe they're not as interested in osteoporosis, and congestive obstructive pulmonary disease, or bunions, as they are in eternal life. But you'll notice that, that none of the quotes or headlines says anything about the incredible range of age-related diseases and disorders that would have to be solved if Aubrey's promise to abolish aging were to be fulfilled. You've heard a, a different story from, from Aubrey tonight. You'd think that the Sense Foundation is, is focused entirely on research aimed simply at understanding um, and treating age-related um, disease. But look at what he wrote in this year's annual report. Recently, a number of people have told me that my message has changed. They are surprised that I might object to a headline discussing thousand-year-old lifespans. They believe that I've toned down my approach to discussing Sense Foundation's research and its implications. I can see why people think this. It's true that the things that I'm now saying are different from the things that I've been saying in the past. 
But it isn't my message that's different, or Sense Foundations for that matter, but rather the topics that we're discussing. So Aubrey might have been persuaded by bad publicity to change what he says, but he hasn't changed his views. I think we need to reflect a little on exactly what we mean by um, ageing, and you've heard some of the difficulty of that already, and where that apoc apocryphal thousand years or so might have come from. Clearly, old animals are different in various ways from young ones. More wrinkly, uh, less mobile, less strength, less uh, stamina, less likely to reproduce. But for our purposes, um, ageing is better defined in terms of, of a propensity to disease and, uh, and to death. Older animals tend more easily to get ill and more commonly to die. The total death rate from all causes is 500 times greater at age 80 than at age 20 in this country. Um, and indeed, 80-year-olds are 1,000 times more likely to die from uh, common cancers other than those related with, uh, to changes in, 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 uh, in sex hormones. The common sense interpretation is that some inevitable gradual degradation of cellular processes let's call it ageing, must underlie this, this increasing tendency to illness. Uh, but as you've heard from, uh, from Richard, uh, together with, with Richard Dole, um, he, um, he explained that um, although old, old mice tend more frequently to get cancer than, than young mice, dramatically so, their total lifespan is only two and a half years compared with, uh, with humans, and they calculated that a gram of tissue in a mouse is at any age a trillion times more likely to develop cancer than a gram of tissue in a human being of the same age. So if a tendency to disease is what people mean by aging, it certainly isn't a process that's shared by um, all cells with similar genomes. It must somehow be regulated by factors that can be inherited differently in different species. Well, some have argued that uh, aging is, is actively uh, genetically programmed into animals. In the uh, heartless rule book of evolution, death is surely a good thing um, unless it happens before you manage to, to reproduce. If living too long is such an obvious evolutionary disadvantage, could death just be a, a clever genetic strategy? Organisms that die off promptly after completing the duty of reproduction do a favor to their offspring Perhaps natural selection has naturally selected genes that tend to kill off those who've outlived their usefulness. This kind of um, Darwinian explanation for death is almost certainly correct for some species. Take, for instance, uh, the mayfly. Uh, its fate is evident in the Greek name of the order of insects to which it um, belongs, which means short-lived winged creatures. The larval stage, lucky larva, survives in freshwater streams and rivers for a year or more. And the beautiful adults have the pleasure of, of flight, wings. The males have large eyes to spot females, very long front legs to grab them in midair. And both males and females have two sets of genitalia. Uh, the good news then is aerial hanky-panky. The bad news is that they live for only a few minutes. Their genes don't even bother to endow them with a, with a proper mouth and guts, so they starve to death as soon as the fun's over. Being unable to eat is a pretty extreme genetic adaptation. But the cells of every species tend to accumulate molecular mistakes as they grow older, and some of these occur because of specific genetic programs. Some gene, genes, for instance, that are essential for um, early development produce uh, proteins that damage older cells. And the repair of DNA, which is essential to prevent cancer, gets less efficient over time. The unfortunate may, mayfly is um, an extreme example. Um, in, some, in most species, there might simply have been no pressure to select genes that specifically protect um, older cells after the age at which their owner is capable of passing on their genes. More remarkable is the fact that some species seem not to age at all, or, or hardly at all. The famous bristle cone pines of California, for instance, uh, certain uh, jellyfish and sea anemones and fish and lobsters grow continuously by replacing cells, replacing perhaps all of their cells. They survive for very long periods. They, they do die eventually, but only because something kills them or infects them or serves them up with hollandaise sauce. Whatever the genetic mechanism for regulating cell protection, the fact that life expectancy varies so much from animal to animal is, of course, a great encouragement to Aubrey and others who are keen to prolong human life. Much of the effort to find a modern-day elixir of life is aimed at promoting 
stem cell repair or propping up creaking mitochondria in an attempt to replace or repair tired cells. Aubrey does understand that the problem of simply fixing all the problems that lead to human disease is not trivial. But he has boundless confidence in the pace of biomedical research and the omnipotence of researchers. That's very flattering of you, Aubrey, but there's an important dividing line between confidence and delusion. Aubrey um, describes the seven deadly sins of aging, the seven changes that increase susceptibility to the diseases of old age, changes inside cells, between cells, outside cells, changes in chromosomes, mitochondria, and so on. But these simple slogans gloss over the extraordinary complexity and variety of disease, all with different causes, different patterns of pathology. Each one of those seven categories consists of a breathtaking variety of potential physical and chemical errors. Take one of the most important of the deadly sins, changes in chromosomes. Now that sounds like a simple problem to tackle. Aubrey knows about the 23 pairs of chromosomes in human cells. He knows about the 3 billion base pairs that encode information in our DNA. Errors in individual bases can, of course, directly cause disease. Take, for example, the terrible neurodegenerative condition Huntington's disease, which I know a little about because my own research group has worked on it for about 10 years. You'd think that Huntington's disease would be really easy to understand and to fix. It's, it's a simple autosomal dominant inherited disorder. If you've got the mutation, you'll get the, uh, the disease. The gene was identified in 1993, the first gene cloned for a human neurological um, condition. We know the nature of the protein which is produced by the gene. We know which specific nerve cells are affected uh, in, the, in the brain uh, and eventually die. A genetically engineered mouse has been created which carries the human gene, finding his disease, and that's been enormously valuable in promoting uh, res research. Yet, despite the apparent simplicity of this disease, we still don't really understand what actually goes wrong, why particular nerve cells are affected. We don't understand why the symptoms usually appear in, in, in sort of early middle age, even though the mutant gene was present throughout life. Most depressing of all, despite the vast amount of research on Huntington's disease, um, it hasn't given us any clear idea how to develop a drug to, uh, to treat it or a strategy to prevent it. And even if we had such a drug tomorrow, the clinical trials that would be needed before the new treatment could be approved and distributed would take another probably 10 years. Remember Aubrey's prediction that within 25 to 30 years from now, we have, we'll have a 50-50 chance of completely stopping people from dying of old age. But it's nearly 20 years since the gene for Huntington's was identified. Uh, that's the simplest brain disease to understand, and we're still at least 10 years away from having a treatment. Now think of the myriad other diseases of the nervous system that aren't simply genetic disorders, much more complicated and unclear in their molecular basis. <laughs> Schizophrenia, uh, migraine, Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, stroke, epilepsy, brain tumors, depression, macular degeneration, deafness. Age is a risk factor for many of those brain disorders, as well as, of course, for a vast range of other clinical conditions, cancers, heart disease, um, uh, arthritis, diabetes, and so on. There's not going to be a quick fix for brain diseases, Aubrey, but a little more of this later. Cell replacement, as you've heard, plays a big role in Aubrey's list of engineered repairs, and I know a little bit about that. I was, I was chairman of the International um, Stem Cell Forum. What I know is that there is great hope for the gradual development of stem cell therapies. But there's also the realization that the technical problems are huge, time scale very long, and unfortunately rampant cell replacement of the sort that works apparently well enough in bristlecone pines carries its own risk, the risk that it might get over rampant and cause cancer. Now some, perhaps as he said, not, not Aubrey himself, see an attractive alternative to the patch and repair approach to life extension. They want to go straight for the elixir a single uh, magic bullet to extend human life. And one of the most interesting approaches to this quest is the discovery that basically starving animals can actually make them live longer. In the 1930s, scientists discovered that rats live longer if they're fed on a low calorie diet. So do mice, fish, dogs, flies, worms, and even yeast. A recent uh, publication on the effect of, uh, uh, of calorie restriction in, in monkeys although superficially positive, has been very heavily criticized, greeted rather skeptically. 
Um, um, uh, nevertheless, that general area of work has stimulated um, a, a great interest in the possibility of, of developing some quick fix would, which would go to the heart of the mechanism of, of calorie restriction. Um, there's some evidence that the effect involves activation of a family of seven enzymes called sirtuins. Resveratrol, which is a substance found in grape skins, unfortunately at very low levels in wine itself, seems to, um, to activate one of those uh, sirtuins, and there are claims that uh, that substance, resveratrol, extends life expectancy in at least yeast, worms and fruit flies, but probably not in mice. An alternative theory says that calorie restriction inhibits another molecular pathway that regulates energy utilization. And a substance called rapamycin, a bacterial product first found in soil samples from Easter Island, which inhibits that pathway, does extend life in, in yeast. But, uh, significantly in mice, it decreases mortality um, even in, if given in, in middle age. So there's some interesting areas of research here. These modern searches for the philosopher's stone have so far been um, hardly more successful, though, than the multitude of efforts in the past. Uh, more than 2,000 years ago, the, the Chinese were eating jade and drinking gold to try to live longer. By the 6th century AD, the fashion there was for mercury, sulfur, and arsenic. Yes, arsenic. For the Scots and Irish, whiskey has always been thought to have life-preserving properties. In 18th century Europe, inhaling the sweet breath of virgins was supposed to be very good for elderly men. In 1889, the eminent physiologist uh, um, Edouard brun séquin announced that he'd devised a rejuvenating therapy by inje injecting himself with a liquid derived from the testicles of dogs and guinea pigs. And in the 1990s, Virginia Medical School professor uh, William Redelson uh, touted melatonin. Only 18 months ago, uh, Dr. Nissoli from the University of Milan announced that drinking water containing a, a battery of amino acids extended the lifespan of mice by 12%. There's a lot of this going on. And at first blush, this burgeoning field of research seems both noble and profound. But success in achieving the goal of, of immortality would be a disaster of apocalyptic precaution, proportions. The first and most obvious problem is that many things go wrong in old cells. Clearly, there is no single aging process that increases the risk of all age-related disease. If that were the case, the patterns of disease in individuals would be much more similar than it is. So one huge worry is that the discovery of a treatment that arrests one aspect of cellular aging might reduce the incidence of one group of diseases and therefore extend average life expectancy. But if it didn't also miraculously fix all the other problems of old cells, it would simply lead to people living longer but getting the other diseases of aging. The hydra-headed problem of life extension, chop one head off and another one grows, is actually already with us. Let me explain. Life expectancy in the developed world has been increasing by an average of seven hours a day. Think about that, seven hours a day increase in average life expectancy since 1840 when records uh, began. This is the simplest indicator of the success of, of, of modern medicine. Each major development in prevention and treatment decreasing a little uh, the average chance of dying. What's really remarkable is the inexorable linearity of this increase despite the, the fact that clearly different, um, uh, different stages in that progress have been driven by different sorts of intervention. Um, benefiting very different groups of, of human beings. Clean water and sanitation, better food in the 19th century, better care for pregnant and birthing mothers and their babies in the early 20th, introduction of vaccines and antibiotics in the 1940s, better treatments for cardiovascular disease, improvements in survival rates for cancer in the late 20th century. And less smoking. And less smoking, well, we'll come to that. <laughs> of course, the, the gradual increase in average lifespan is is generally welcome, but more important is the better prevention and treatment of particular sorts of disease that's driven this change. But the downsize is there's been little or no change in the pattern of incidence of other age-related diseases that can't yet be adequately treated. The chance of getting Alzheimer's doubles every five years from the age of 65. More than 40% of people are, are over, the, over the age of 84 in the United States are said to have Alzheimer's. The World Alzheimer Report 2011 estimated that 36 million people cu currently suffer from dementia, ma mainly caused by Alzheimer's, is projected to quadruple by 2050. The economic cost of dementia alone, calculated at more than $600 billion, 
about 1% of the entire world GDP. So the um, problem is that almost no neurological or mental health problem can yet be really effectively treated, let alone prevented. Indeed, we won't even understand the causes of, we don't even understand the causes of most of the major nervous system disorders. As I already said, age is a serious risk factor for many of the most debilitating and costly of these diseases, including stroke and depression and all of the neurodegenerative diseases. The horrifying increase that we're already experiencing the prevalence of brain disorders is the downside of the increase in life expectancy that we've already enjoyed. It is a dilemma. I mean, I respond to some of Aubrey's challenge about what we should do in the face of it, but we have to recognize the problem. Aubrey, I suppose, would simply say, well, give me the money and we'll solve all of these problems in 20 to 25 years. I'm afraid that vastly underestimates how long it takes to develop safe new treatments, even when the causes of disease are completely understood. Remember, for example, the, perhaps the most significant uh, recent development in, in uh, new drug treatments, the development of monoclonal antibodies. We know a lot about that because it was largely achieved in the MRC, Laboratory of Molecular Biology in, in Cambridge. The story started in the 1950s with Cesar Milstein's in, in interest in the diversity of, uh, of antibodies and his desire to produce large quantities of pure antibodies. And as you'll know that he, am I over time? That's slightly. Am I really? All right. I'll let me come to the punchline. You can, you can sit down. <laughs> it, and the point there is it took uh, something like 35 years of work in perhaps the, the best biological laboratory in the world to develop the first drug for treating one disease. It's a long business. Okay. Um, Aubrey has his supporters, of course. Um, uh, the American futurologist and fan of transhumanism, Ray Kurzweil, writing in the High Impact Journal, The Sun, said, I, I, I and many other scientists now believe that around 20 years we'll have the means to reprogram our body's stone age software so we can halt and then reverse aging. Then nanotechnology will let us live forever. Nanotechnology will extend our mental capacities. To such an extent, we'll be able to write books within minutes. Virtual sex will become commonplace. I expect it was the sun that asked for that, that line. So with friends like that, Aubrey, maybe you don't need enemies, but, but I'm afraid you have got some. Um, the uh, uh, the biogerontology community is divided on the idea of engineered um, treatment of senescence. But one has to say that still a very large fraction of the leaders of it are strongly opposed. Jay Olshansky, for instance, said to get to the figure of 5,000 years, you'd only have some people, you have some people living to 10,000 or 15,000 years. The only place that's going to happen is in Aubrey's work. And in a BBC News website article responding to Aubrey's article, um, he said um, that uh, Kurzweil and, and, and Aubrey are tantalizing us with the tale that we all so desperately want to hear and, uh, uh, and have wanted to hear for thousands of years. Live life without frailty and debility and dependence and be forever young. The seduction will no doubt last longer than its proponents. In 2005, 26 leading experts in aging research from North America and Europe published a paper in the EMBO journal um, entitled Science Fact and Sense, Sense as Agenda. Um, and they considered critically Aubrey's ideas about engineered negligible senescence and wrote, in the word of the great American journalist H.L. Uh, Mencken, for every complex problem is a simple solution and it's wrong. Um, each one of the specific proposals that comprise the sense agenda is, at our present stage of ignorance, exceptionally optimistic. Therefore, by multiplying the probabilities of success, the claim that all of these proposals can be accomplished, although presented with confidence in de Grey's writing, seems nonsensical, and so on. Um, the the uh, American uh, biogerontologist bio Richard uh, Miller was, was at least humorous in his criticism. This is a message from him to Aubrey. Dear Aubrey, I saw you on TV the other day and was hoping that now that the aging problem's been solved, you might have time to help me in my publicity campaign to solve a similar engineering challenge, one that's been too long ignored by the ultra-conservative frady cat mainstream scientific community, the problem of producing flying pigs. We, we mustn't be afraid to debate with Aubrey and to give him a hearing. After all, disagreement plays a large part in the progress of science. Even maverick ideas can sometimes be correct in driving paradigms of, uh, of change in science. But it's essential that discussion and the consideration of alternative views is based on solid evidence and realistic analysis and not contaminated by hype and trial um, by media. So I've argued that um, the complete elimination of aging would be dangerous. Fortuitously, fortunately, it's, um, 
it, it's um, impracticable. Um, and I would um, urge you um, to uh, set aside what is um, doubtless your opinion of um, Aubrey and his um, eloquence. It's a bloke, he's a nice guy, he's likable, clever, sincere, and well-intentioned, but that's not what we're debating tonight. The issue is whether it's realistic, worthwhile, and morally defensible to try to eliminate aging completely, and I urge you to vote against the motion. <laughs> Well, Aubrey, you scrupulously kept time, and your enemy did not. And so I think I should give you the first opportunity to say whatever comes into your head. I thought I was going to have a little more time to think about that. <laughs> All right, then. I can ask a more specific question if no, you like. No, no, I, I, I'm going to start with that, yes. Um, I was actually quite perplexed at the enormously high proportion of Colin's remarks that did not actually directly address the particular approach to combating aging that I have been propounding for the past decade, namely the regenerative medicine approach. It seems to me that it's very odd to try to cast doubt on the plausibility or the promise of one method for achieving a given technological goal by highlighting the failures of completely unrelated approaches, which Colin spent a remarkable amount of his time doing. Um, I was also rather surprised that towards the end of his remarks he mentioned the rather sharp and acrimonious criticisms of my work that were published several years ago without, first of all, even mentioning the fact that I wrote replies, published replies to these things, and also without mentioning the fact that they were several years ago. I mentioned in my own remarks that a large number of mainstream gerontologists have in fact come around in that period of time to the understanding that this is indeed a very promising and plausible approach, even though they may have been seduced into signing up to these, as I say, rather vehement criticisms way back in the mid-2000s. I'm also quite surprised at the idea that it's worth bringing up Ray Kurzweil. I think it's rather unscientific, personally, to uh, challenge the um, scientific proposals and technological proposals of a colleague on the basis of the company he keeps. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, also, I would like to mention, finally, the issue of Alzheimer's disease, which, of course, is an absolutely tragic epidemic in the modern world today. But I think we do have to acknowledge that very few of us would say that we were wrong to postpone cardiovascular disease and other diseases which we've succeeded in postponing, and as a result of which the epidemic of Alzheimer's is a lot bigger than it otherwise would have been. We all know that the best way to make progress in the incidence of cancer is to kill all the cardiovascular researchers so that they don't make any further progress, but it's not really what most people are choosing to do. Um, I think I'll stop there for the moment. I'm fairly sure I'll come up with some more in due course. <laughs> okay. Now, Colin, um, I think that the one point that I don't think you did address enough is the question of, is there some in a sense of common mechanism rather than just lots and lots of different things. It does seem as though lifespan is under such tight evolutionary control. I mean, it's only several tens of millions of years ago that we diverged from rats, less in some people's case. Mm. And over that time, we've got this enormous factor by which, the, by which all sorts of things disappear. I mean, an aged rat hops <coughs> around mm. and really looks like an aged rat. Mm. But, but, but as I said, that, that the very fact that in quite a short period of evolutionary time, um, maximum lifespan can, can be vary so much between species is clearly an encouragement to those people who believe that there is, there is a, a kind of key which, if un uh, unlocked, uh, could significantly extend human lifespan. I mean, the real, the, the real issue is, and it's something that nobody's talked about yet, is the fact that at, at present, no one has ever lived, as far as we know, beyond, despite you know, Methuselah stories and so on, beyond 122 years. So the question is, as we nudge forward in life expectancy by developing a new drug to treat a disease that, usually, that used to kill a few people or have a strategy like stopping smoking, but saves the lives or delays the death of large numbers of people. I mean, much of the gain of life expectancy for older people 
in the last 20 or 30 years has been produced by uh, reducing smoking, not by drug treatments or better fancy MRI scanners and that kind of stuff. So all of those things add into the equation. But the, but the, the, the interesting question is, will that simply push us up against this 122-year-old ab absolute stopper? I mean, is there, is there a really finite limit to how old people can become? I would be very much in favor if we could ever you know, solve Alzheimer's, but I tried to give an impression of the magnitude of the problems of tackling all of these diseases, the amount of effort and expenditure that we need would be needed for each of them even to approach understanding them, let alone curing them. But if we could do it, gradually nibbling away at the suffering of the 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds and get towards that 120-year-old limit, well, I think we have to think a little bit about the demographic consequences of that and the economic ones, but in general, of course, it would be welcome. The real worry, and it is a worry, is the possibility of some kind of breakthrough that suddenly bursts through the 122 years and pushes on towards 300, 400, 500, 1,000, and whatever. And, we, and to think about that, we have to detach ourselves from selfishness. Anyone individually, aged 90 or 100, 120, or whatever it is, given the opportunity to extend their lives and still be healthy, of course would say, great, yes, I'll take the pill. Um, but we do have to think of the cascade of consequences for the world as a whole if we all lived to twice the human age span, not to mention 10 times. Coming back to, I'd like to press you a little bit more on mechanisms though, because there is one category of cell that seems to live forever, and that is the germ cell. So by what mechanisms do germ cells get transmitted to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, without the accumulation of this catastrophic amount of aging? And it does suggest that there's something really quite striking and qualitative there to be discovered. I know, you know, if they do anything really wrong, they'll get bumped off by natural selection. Mm -hmm. But still, yeah. they do seem to manage to avoid the swings and arrows of outrageous fortune that get the other cells. Well, well you're quite right. Um, and stem cells too, of course, in the embryo um, seem to, you know, to contradict general rules. But there's, a, there's enormous variation amongst the cells in your body as to how long they will last. I um, mean, cells in your skin maybe last only a few... Uh, days or weeks, N neurons in your brain have to last a lifetime because, you know, with a few exceptions, they can't be replaced at all. So there've got to be clever tricks that cells can use to repair themselves. Yeah, well, and presumably that, that, that germline is sort of denizens of geologic time, aren't absolutely, they? Absolutely. So there must be very clever mechanisms they have for reconstructing themselves from generation right. to generation. Are they going to get discovered, those mechanisms? Well, that'd be very worrying if they were, because if they applied to all cells, we'd be in real trouble, in my opinion. Aubrey, you, when you were talking, you said that the motion had to be concerned partly with the desirability and partly with the feasibility. Yes. And although you've used the phrase regenerative, med regenerative medicine, what has actually been discovered that really makes any of these things about, you know, somebody now alive might live to be a thousand or some other such phrases remotely plausible? I've, 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 I've not heard anything that makes these things sound at all plausible okay. in terms of research programs. But sure. not, not just those words, regenerative medicine again, but what, what are you talking about? Sure, absolutely, fine question. <laughs> so, um, the main criticism that uh, actually began one of the articles that Colin referred to uh, that was published several years ago discussing my work by other gerontologists the main thing was actually the assertion that this is implausible because not one of these seven things that Aubrey proposes has ever been shown to extend life in any organism. And in my reply, I pointed out that Henry Ford um, did not tend to caution his potential customers that the individual components of a car tend to remain obstinately stationary when burning petrol is poured upon them, and they have to be put together before motion actually is seen. So it's not expected that we would see actual extension of longevity as a result of partial implementation of, re of this regenerative approach. What we must therefore do is not look at the question as basic scientists, but rather as technologists. We must ask whether the individual components are in range of doing what they are supposed to do, and then ask whether, hypothetically, when we put them all together, it seems likely that they would achieve the overall goal. So now, if we ask the question, what components of regenerative medicine are we talking about? One of them is certainly stem cell therapies, which, of course, Colin mentioned. Now, 
some aspects of aging are predominantly caused by the loss of cells, the cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division and differentiation of other cells. Parkinson's disease is a fine example of this. And sure enough, people are working very hard and very optimistically to develop stem cell therapies to treat Parkinson's disease. It's at an early stage, but there are already early stage clinical trials. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but when it works, it works spectacularly. So this is just one example. The earlier stage um, stuff that Sense Foundation is mainly focused on is indeed early stage. But again, it's all focused on restoring the molecular and cellular composition, structure of all our tissues, the whole body, to how it is at an earlier age. And one thing we can say that certainly does not need any evidence from biology is that the human body is a machine and therefore that its function and its longevity is determined by its structure. So it's only a matter of how comprehensively we need to restore the structure in order to actually achieve the result. That still didn't sound very specific, but I'll leave it up to the questions from the audience to make this more clear. Um, can, I say, can I say something please. about uh, cell replacement uh, um, therapy? Um, I mean, Aubrey said that enormous advances had been made in the actual use of cell replacement therapy. And I really think that that's not true. I think I'm agreeing with your um, scepticism. I mean, apart from... Uh, I don't from have scepticism, I'm impartial. Uh, um, <laughs> good. Um, apart from, from treatment of, um, of you know, leukaemia with uh, umbilical blood uh, transfer and so on, I, I don't know of any... Um, successful application of uh, stem cell therapy at all. I mean, Geron trial, spinal cord damage has just been uh, abandoned they, and they decided to move out of the stem cell market. Um, there's one potential trial for stem cell treatment for stroke, the re neuron trial. There's that very nice work on reconstructive replacement therapy for bits of trachea and stuff that, uh, um, that's been developed, incredibly expensive, and you know, only very few patients treated. But, but I mean, where's... The rest of this miraculous treatment, Parkinson's disease, those trials have largely been abandoned, the trials using replacement um, therapy, because, you know, they're not maintained for long enough and produced all sorts of um, bizarre side effects. And that's Parkinson's where we know exactly where the damage is in the brain. There really is a chance of putting new cells in the right place. We start to look at Alzheimer's and so on. It's really I'd like possible. to get questions from members of the audience now. Now, if possible, could you come here, because we have one roving microphone and Roy is holding it. Stand up, please. Um, are there any members of the audience who would like to ask questions? Um, we also asked if we could take microphones up there. For some arcane reason to do with Oxford University, we're not allowed to take microphones up there. So if you want to say anything, come down here. Come stand in the centre. Please come over yeah, here. Make a, make a line. You can't make a line on your own. Uh, hi there. Can I uh, ask a question about the, the length of time before we get a result. So uh, cheap, uh, nuclear fusion, uh, cheap energy from nuclear fusion has been 20 years away and it has been 20 years away uh, for the last 40 years. And what I'd like to ask is, you make a prediction about 20, 25 years away. Is there a shorter term prediction of something which isn't the complete answer but that would convince Colin and others? There is indeed. The, the, the the estimate that I give of a 50-50 chance of developing these technologies to a decisive level of comprehensiveness within the next 25 years or so is, of course, very speculative. And I am totally willing to admit that it's a subjective estimate. But one thing that it is based on is my estimate of how long it's going to take to do the equivalent level of comprehensiveness in mice. And I think that we have a high probability of being less than 10 years away from that, which is a much more um, plausible timescale for scientists and technologists to be talking about, albeit still somewhat speculative. I do actually want, however, to, uh, to add one more thing supplementary to that. The motion tonight is not this House wants to defeat ageing entirely within the next 25 years. The fact is, so what if it takes twice as long as I'm saying? Does that make it less desirable? Does that make it even less feasible? <coughs> We're not really talking tonight about the accuracy of any particular scientist's prediction of time frames. We're talking about whether this is something we should be prioritizing as a research and technology goal. So, can I just ask you... No, so you have to do it with the microphone. Sorry. Sorry. 
<clears throat> if, if you were able to achieve that within 10 years for mice, Colin, would you accept the, the validity of his argument? Can we, can we close this argument in 10 years' time? Uh, inconceivable. Absolutely inconceivable. I mean, you're really talking about addressing all age-related conditions to a sufficient extent to be able to patch them up in whatever... I don't think you're them. answering his That's, question. What? His question is, if we do it in mice, will we do it for humans? If, you, oh, if we can do it in mice, will we do it in humans? Yeah, but it's, it's not even worth... You know, it's not even worth considering <laughs> an utterly implausible possibility. What's the point? You know, if you have angels on the, on the, on the, on the, on the point of a, of a, of a pin, it's, it's a non-question a non because it is inconceivable. Sounds like the answer is yes, then. We will close the question in 10 years. <laughs> OK. Um, please, can you come up to the front and ask a question at the microphone here? Oh, you've got one there. OK, please. Um, I think that... A Aubrey de Grey did address this partially in his uh, speech when he mentioned the kind of categories that uh, potential objectors to his work might fall into. And the last one being those who would say the result would be undesirable. But I don't feel that your dismissal of that as a criticism was adequate to satisfy my particular criticism that's like that. Are you saying the question of undesirability was not sufficiently addressed? Uh, yeah, which is basically that, as you said, we need to think as technologists on this issue, but something that technologists have often had a blind spot for is the consequences of their work based on the way that society is organised and the way that their work influences the organisation of society. But we currently live in a world where insulin treatment for diabetes has been around for many decades, yet still hundreds of thousands of people a year die in the United States of America because they can't afford any health insurance and they can't get any insulin. How would the introduction of regenerative anti-aging therapy possibly have a positive effect in a world so characterized by inequality of healthcare provision? So, as you say, I did somewhat address this question. Let me repeat or at least um, expand on my answer. The fact is that I, as a technologist, do indeed think very seriously about the potential consequences of success in developing this. But I also think, and I urge everyone in the room to think, about the potential consequences of failure in this, which of course would be the outcome of not trying. The fact is, we have a bit of a problem today. Out of the 150,000 people who die each day from all causes added together worldwide, two-thirds of them, 100,000 per day, die of aging. And most of those people do so after a significant period of debilitation and disease and decrepitude and general misery. That seems like quite a big problem that we have today. And I think that when we consider, even in any kind of arbitrary worst case scenario, problems that might be created in the process of solving that problem, then we need to think very clearly and have a sense of proportion in balancing the severity of the two problems. Hello. Um, my question is directed more at Colin. And I just wanted to, to decide for myself whether the option to increase my lifespan uh, possibly for thousands of years. Um, whether that is desirable to me would depend on what state of mind that would include. And I mean, we heard Colin say that, you know, the, the, the number of nerve cells stays relatively constant over time. There's some repair, but not, not much. So with my experience of memories fading over time, would that actually mean that you know, we, we, we might only have a certain memory into the past of, say, 100 years, 120 years, and pull that along, and, and behind those 120 years, everything would fade away. So we would, you know, we would only have a, you know, little span of memories available. Um, I think that, wouldn't, that would make it less desirable for me because I would forget all the stuff that I learned in the beginning, right? Is there any evidence for the limited capacity of memory that could have such you'd, you'd always still have Facebook. <laughs> a thousand years from now, you can go back through your timeline you know, and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. It was only 800 years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think that the problem of the nervous system, I mean, I emphasize it, but I think we, you know, we are still failing to understand the complexity of how we can keep nervous systems going for long periods of, of time. 
Um, it is quite remarkable that nerve cells survive as long as they, they do, but you know there's probably about a 2% loss in cell number from the age of about 65 um, onwards. It's inexorable, you extend that out for, two, for a thousand years and it's, it's pretty catastrophic. Um, and you know, if we can't, I mean, what would life be like if the rest of the body was working okay, it'd been patched up with a bit of cell therapy here and there, but you know, you've got no brain. I mean, this, this is a significant worry. You're not entering imaginatively enough into the possibilities, Colin. Uh, I'm trying, Richard, I'm trying. There's a question over there, I believe, is that right? Oh, sorry. Um, I have a question for Aubrey de Grey. Um, so we've uh, heard aging characterized as um, either uh, perhaps the accumulation of damage or perhaps some active process uh, that uh, kills us off because there's some evolutionary uh, benefit to it. Um, but how about we have a look at it as uh, the sort of logical consequence of a developmental program and we come to sort of related point uh, as to the one that was just made about uh, the de development of the nervous system. So as Colin Blakemore is very qualified to um, assert, is, uh, the, the brain is very plastic as we, uh, as we uh, are very young. But, um, and, and as we learn to deal with the world, but as we get older, uh, this capacity greatly diminishes. And my question is, would we really want to be static in a changing world? So, we of course still have a great deal to discover about why plasticity and how plasticity diminishes during time, especially the extent to which it does so during adulthood. We don't know how much of that diminution in plasticity is caused by the very structural changes, the molecular and cellular changes that the regenerative medicine approach seeks to repair. We also don't know how much of it is caused by simple societal aspects, the fact that uh, the elderly are forced to spend so much of their time doing things they're already good at um, and so much less of their time learning new skills and such like. There may very well be implications of all of these uncertainties for how we might restructure society in a post-aging world to encourage um, serial careers, for example. But I really don't think we can actually answer these questions now. And therefore, again, this cannot be seen as a reason not to develop these technologies because 50 years from now, people who don't have the ability to avoid aging medically but could have had it if we had got on with the job will not be very happy if it turns out that our speculations about synaptic plasticity turned out to be wrong. I think it was David but, Sackett who argued for the compulsory retirement of experts. When any, whenever anybody has been an expert in a field for 10 years, then they should absolutely be forced out of it because probably after their first 10 years, they're doing more harm than good in the field that they're in. But the main thing is, their undoubted genius would refresh some different field. But anyway, he argues that all experts should be retired after a maximum of 10 years in any field. Uh, yes, my question's for Professor Blakemore. Can you stand um, up, please? Um, so you mentioned Alzheimer's disease as a sort of consequence of um, medical science being better at keeping people alive, and Aubrey had sort of started on a rebuttal to that point. Um, my question is, with something like that, or another example that comes to mind would be um, human effects on something like climate change, do you think that we've got to a point in society where um, scientific advancement has potentially gone too far and now we're reaping the consequences in future generations. I, I, I don't think you can ever say it's, it's scientific discovery that's gone too far. It's what use people decide to make of it. And, you know, that's up to you and people. It's very, very difficult to decide in advance what areas of science should not progress. But how that knowledge is then applied and used is, you know, up to the public. And the one big problem here is that if decisions are made at an individual and selfish level. What would I like to do just for me? Yes, I'd like to use more energy, even if it's from fossil fuels, because it keeps me warm and I can run my air conditioner. If those sorts of decisions are made at an individual level, the effects for others, for community as a whole and for the planet can be disastrous. And I think that we face that kind of decision or that uh, kind of possibility when we consider the proposals for for um, age extension. At an individual level, it might be very attractive, but we have to stand back and think about the consequences. The, uh, can I just make, make a point? I mean, we, as I said, the phenomenon is happening anyway, and has been since 1840. We live longer. Um, in the last 30 years, 
Um, men aged 65 in this country have enjoyed an increase in life expectancy, an increase in future life expectancy beyond age 65 of something like seven or eight years. <clears throat> Since the introduction of the first Pension Act, the Lloyd George Act in 1908, and the late 1980s, men could expect on average to live for another 10, 11 years or so after the age of 65. Absolutely flat. It's now increasing by 2.5 months uh, per annum. Um, to a very large extent because of reduction in, in, in smoking, it's true. But that is, to a large extent, the explanation of the, of the crisis in social pension provision, national pension provision in this country, in fact, all through the developed world, the little bit of the few years of extra life that we've gained, because we come with the entitlement uh, of, of state uh, pensions for as long as we live, and that's driving an increased demand on the resourcing of those things. Imagine if that were to continue suddenly, suddenly to change by 20, 30, 40 years. It would be utterly catastrophic for pension systems. I'm not the first person to make that, that argument. Yes, the um, idea that we shouldn't defeat ageing and alleviate all the suffering that goes with ageing because people haven't been very good at figuring out how to reorganise the economy to pay pensions right. seems to be a weak argument to me. Not at all. Uh, not at all. I mean, there are things that just should not be done if we recognise that the downside of doing them is too great. But is the downside What about so eugenics, great? for instance? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's a wonderful so thing to do. Perhaps we've just had difficulty raising the pension age as rapidly as age-related age ill health has been postponed simply because there hasn't been much of a problem until now. Maybe when the problem does get severe, it'll be rather like four years ago with the credit crunch, when suddenly it was possible for politicians to make dramatic changes to things just because people knew they weren't in Kansas anymore. I think we do have to rise above the immediate problems of the pension system. Um, there is the question <laughs> of... There is the question that... Aubrey stated that we are asking, is it at least reasonably plausible that some such thing will be achieved? And as well, if, so, if it is, then are we for it or against it? And curiously, you just now said, you know, you never really know what science is going to discover. Mm -hmm. You just go ahead with what's interesting, but somehow if it's interesting, that's a measure of scientific quality control. Uh, but I qualified it by saying that, you know, it is up to politicians and the public to decide how to use that knowledge. Well, if politicians and the public had been voting on whether to think about geology in the middle of the 19th century, then they would have kept those geologists with their hammers away from the rocks, and then the myths of the flood and of eternal life following would have been unimpaired. Yeah, well, people are capable of detaching themselves from you know, their individual interests or their prejudices. I mean, I think that the, you know, it, chaotic though it sometimes is, the global debate about global warming and, its, and the man-made contribution to it and what we collectively might do to, to, to help to resolve it, despite the cost at an individual level, is really a quite remarkable example of altruism and making sensible decisions about how to make use of scientific knowledge. OK, question over there. Hello, and I've soon we're going to move on to riposts, but I think not for another seven minutes. I've got a comment on something that Colin said about um, stem cell and germline ageing. And um, I think you're a little disingenuous. We do know a little bit about the mechanism, as in there's very good quality control on mitochondria, yeah. um, investment in DNA repair, and particularly telomerase, as in adding chromosome ends back on. And we do know that some level of rejuvenation is possible. There was a paper recently by Jess Kalukov um, suggesting that if you reactivate telomerase in aged cells, you can rejuvenate the tissue. Um, it's not just replacing old things, it's actually making them better. You can replace um, germline um, brain tissue, the gut was better. All of the tissues that degenerate with, with old age were made better in the mice that had telomerase reactivated. So you were saying that there was no mechanism. There is some mechanism, there is some proof of principle out there. I know it's very preliminary, but there is some work out there. Yes, no, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I, I certainly didn't intend to be disingenuous, whoever does. Um, um, and, and I did mention that there might be specially heightened mechanisms of DNA re repair and, and, and so on. And yes, telomerase is, telomere length is an important um, factor. Of course, there's a, if you're suggesting that the, the modification of telomerase activity might be a general mechanism that might be used to manipulate life expectancy, there are, there are of course, are risks associated with that because the downsides of encouraging proliferation is the potential for cancer. 
Thank you. Um, question for Dr. De Grey. Uh, my understanding from what Professor Blakemore, from his speech, was that he was, as it were, um, pitching programs like we can have here in Oxford that are not related to SCNS about uh, studying uh, conditions like Alzheimer's disease or cancer with the hope of, of treating these conditions. And he was presenting these as serious science and pitching them against your program. Uh, would you like to um, perhaps clarify the nature of your program and the relation, uh, as you see it, between your program and these uh, unrelated or not directly related programs? Do you see uh, your program as an alternative to these? And, and would, if your program were to succeed, would it make these various other research programs obsolete, basically? Or do you see them more as complementary? So if they succeed, they would actually even increase the likelihood of uh, success of your own program? So, uh, of course, I can only give a very brief answer in this format, but of course I do encourage people to read the very extensive amount that I've published on this, uh, uh, the book that I wrote five years ago, Ending Aging, which has a very great deal of detail on this, and also, of course, all my published academic work. Um, however, in very brief, um, the answer to your question is, yes, I think that these things are complementary. If we can, most of the work that's going on against the diseases of old age that is radically different from the regenerative medicine approach consists of trying to find ways to slow down the progression of, well, the accumulation of various types of molecular and cellular damage and the progression of diseases that result from them. And the regenerative approach is to try to repair that damage. Now, in general, the regenerative approach is, as Colin has been repeatedly emphasizing, quite challenging to actually implement. And I, I think I would certainly agree, in many cases, more challenging to implement than approaches that merely slow down the accumulation of such damage. But that means that clearly the way in which we will alleviate the greatest amount of suffering and save the greatest number of lives is by implementing both approaches as quickly as possible so that the weaker but nevertheless more tractable uh, interventions can then give a greater number of people the opportunity to live long enough, healthy enough, to benefit from the more difficult interventions that come under the regenerative medicine rubric. Yeah. A uh, question for either of you. So one is aging of an organism as a whole, but are there specific cellular aging processes which we may want to sort of stop to help cure certain kinds of diseases? I mean, this idea of telomerases, uh, can, can they be useful for certain kinds, not stopping aging of the whole organism, but certain cellular processes? Your first comment? No, you take it while I think of an example. <laughs> <laughs> Great mind, think alike, eh? Um, um, well, I mean, it, it, it's hard to know where to start with that question. Clearly, different cells have different functions in normal metabolism, and as a result of that, they acquire different problems during aging, insofar as some of them, I mean, some of them don't acquire any problems to speak of. Um, therefore, the approach to addressing those problems has to also to be, to a large extent, cell, cell type specific and organ specific. Certainly the regenerative medicine approach is unashamedly a divide and conquer approach that does exactly that. So when I talk about stem cell therapies, for example, uh, I could talk about them as addressing the entire category of types of aging damage that we can describe as cell loss. But clearly, stem cell therapies for different tissues have differences from each other, as well as a great many commonalities. So yeah, but to, to cut a long story short, absolutely. It's a very complex cell-specific, cell type-specific cell -type business. I think I could add, add to, to that that, that um, since the natural capacities for repair certainly vary from tissue to tissue, uh, there's, there's certainly value in focusing on those tissues which aren't able to repair themselves the brain being the prime example, but there are other um, organ systems too. I mean, the islets, the beta, um, the uh, um, insulin I'm producing not cells. Enough. I'm not speaking, I'm sorry, I'm talking to myself. Um, the um, uh, uh, insulin producing cells, for instance, of the, can uh, of, of, of the pancreas would be another good target for special interest in, in trying to eliminate uh, degenerative processes because they have so little capacity to repair themselves. Of course, one thing that you get, it, if you take the intestine, for example, the small intestine, then you've got crypts, and at the bottom of the crypt, not in contact with all the horrible stuff that goes down the small intestine, 
you've got stem cells sitting in quiet dignity, and every now and then, one of them just excretes a committed daughter cell, who will then go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and they'll be the actual side of the small intestine, they'll be doing the work, but they've got clocks ticking in them, they're all going to be thrown away and die, but the stem cells will stay there immortal, well, not immortal, but certainly much more long-lived, and they don't have those clocks ticking. And so there's, there's a definite distinction between whether you set a clock ticking, that's going on within one, within one cell, and the body is mostly committed daughter cells or cells that don't have much capacity for further division. The stem cells are, you know, few and rare, and there may be super stem cells that keep the stem cells supplied, maybe, that's rather hypothetical. But certainly there is a sort of counting within certain cell types. Though it's not exactly the same as ageing of the organism. Um, my question has to do with uh, validating of any potential sort of magic... Validating? Bullet, validating of any uh, potential magic bullet treatment. So, for example, a pill which improves your uh, quality of life in, in uh, old age for five years. Uh, and to do with... If you actually had a hypothesis that a particular treatment did, did do this, how would you then validate that? How, how large and how long would the clinical trials for that have to be? Uh, and given actually the sheer scope of that, um, how realistic is it to, to treat, uh, to actually uh, undertake a potential trial like that? Well, indeed, uh, what would be the condition that you'd specify to the MRSA or the, or the FDA that you're going to treat with this, this pill? I mean, death, death is not um, a, a recognised disease. I think, and I'm not saying this to just to be, to be, 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 be critical of, of Aubrey, but I, mean, I don't think that you'd be able to get um, a, a licence for such a drug. Yes, of course, this is a very important question that many people have brought up in the past. But luckily, it's not as hard to answer as you may think, uh, for two reasons. First thing is that all of the various things we might want to do, at least with the regenerative approach to combating ageing, are things that also have great promise individually as treatments for specific diseases. So the regulatory issue of ageing not being considered to be something for which one can have a drug or whatever is not as insurmountable as it may sound. We can see these, th we can envisage such, all of the relevant treatments being developed to address specific diseases and being combined in perhaps some kind of off-label manner. The other thing to bear in mind in terms of the practicality of a clinical trial is that with the regenerative pr approach where we are actually repairing damage and turning back the clock, we can expect to see a statistically significant result much more quickly in terms of even something as basic as mortality rates than we could for a therapy that merely slowed aging down by a factor of, let's say, 1.3. But you are speaking as though where what we are doing is turning back the clock. I mean, this does rather sound as though one actually has such a treatment rather than wishing for such a treatment. Oh, no. I mean, the questioner was talking about these potential treatments, so that's okay. Um, yeah. Um, I just wondered if we could reframe a point that Aubrey <laughs> made earlier on about um, it more being a pursuit rather than worrying about the end game. I wondered if, if Aubrey is right in that we should really by analogy, try and improve people's 100 meter times and then later have to worry about the implications of people that can run faster and whether or not we should slow them down rather than be in a position 20 years later where actually we haven't really improved anything but we're kind of self-satisfied that we don't have a potential headache. We're well, saying basically if we can do it, let's do it and worry about it afterwards, which, you know, is a work quite well in some areas of medicine so far. I, I should perhaps but, clarify that I'm certainly not saying let's do this and worry about the consequences afterwards. I think it's absolutely appropriate to do our very best to forward plan, to foresee what sorts of scenarios, what sorts of changes in society and so on might be motivated by success in this, or even by the widespread anticipation of success, which I think is going to happen much sooner. However, I want to emphasize again that thinking about the potential problems that might be created is not the end of the story. Just switching one's brain off when one's thought of a problem is not the point. One's got to weigh the severity of that problem, the perceived potential severity, against the severity of the problem that we have today and that we would be solving. 
Question there. Can I ask both speakers to say, if the motion was, was possible, what would they imagine the phenotype would be of this particular aged individual? You mean, would there still be anything that we would call human? Well, the question is, what would be, if, okay, if this is possible, then what would be the phenotype of the immortal individual? For me, it's a very simple answer. People would look and feel and function exactly like young adults, however long they lived. I think there's more to it than that. Um, you, uh, let's say it's a thousand years. You've got a thousand years. So you um, have your Sunday lunch, as usual, with your offspring, who could be... 980 years old, or, or could be 20 years old, the whole, that you, uh, you go to work maybe still, get up 8 o'clock in the morning, go on the northern line for another 100 years. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think you're asking, I mean, simply saying that everybody's going to look and act as if they're 30 years old ignores or overlooks the fact that we have a certain, we have a perspective on the duration and the style of our lives, how we fit with reproduction, with our children, our relationship between, with the generations, the different roles that we play in society at different ages, just to suggest that, I mean, it's conceivable, just to suggest that you can kind of insert another 950 years in the middle of that natural pattern of life and that humans will simply adapt to it because physically, they're just like they were always at the age of 30. I think he's actually asking an awful lot. But Colin, isn't that rather similar to saying that we shouldn't increase the pensionable age, even if we do increase the um, length of healthy life? Because the, pen, the, the current work career length is just well, the right length. There are many people that argue exactly that. And that, that there are you know, plenty of people who want to carry on working, but an awful lot. Um, who carry placards in the street in France and say, we've done our bit, we want our re to retire at, at 60. This is a very active and intense debate that raises huge passions right now when we're talking about shifting pension qualification eggs by a year or two. You know, imagine shifting them by a thousand years. Yes, <laughs> I think we should come back to the question of practicality of achieving this. More, concentrate perhaps more on that than on the question of the practicability of, the, um, of reforming the pension schemes. Hi, I think there's sort of an ambiguity in the wording of this debate that allows me to point out a huge elephant in the room. And that huge elephant is the fact that we're not really trying on any of this stuff. So Colin says that it took, you know, we've been looking at Alzheimer's for ages, and I like to think about how much we're spending on Alzheimer's. And I think the best way to understand that is to think about it in terms of pounds per person per year. Now, you've, the average salary in the UK is about 25 grand. The NHS costs us all, every one of us, about 2,000 pounds a year. Alzheimer's, we're spending 81p per person per year looking into. That is an absurd and, frankly, horrible figure, given the horrible uh, consequences of the disease. Other things, uh, cancer, it's gonna, it kills about a third of people at the moment. We spend 10 pounds per person per year from both government and charity investment combined. And um, you know, the, the, the list just goes on. Heart disease kills a similar number of people. It's three pounds. So when Colin says this stuff is very, very hard to develop, sure, but there is no problem. If your boiler went wrong in your house, you wouldn't throw 30p a year at it and hope it fixed itself. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I, in not only agreeing with the questioner, I would like to emphasize a point which I certainly can't claim originality for because gerontologists have been saying it for decades namely that your point is even more strongly the case in respect of attempts to develop interventions against aging. The amount that's spent, the proportion of medical research funding that is spent trying to actually do anything about aging, in other words, trying to develop preventative geriatrics, is absolutely minuscule. And not just in this country, that's the same is true in the US, same is true across the entire industrialized world. So, this is, of course, a very powerful argument for, for prioritizing the development of these therapies, even if experts in general feel that the likelihood of success in developing those therapies is very low. Even if it's only 1%, it still makes sense to spend much more money than we are developing therapies against aging than developing therapies against specific age-related diseases that will not work so well. Yeah, but this is, this is all a matter of resources. And, and I mean, I say this, I mean, um, been you know, head, of the, head of the MRC for four years and seeing the, that kind of ad hoc argument about every area <coughs> of medicine, every clinical problem, every charity that wants more funds put into their area because the problems are so large. 
And the only approach that makes sense is to say, well, we have this pot of money, let's fund the best research with it. Um, funding research of low quality is a waste of money when it could be used to fund good, good research. It would always be nice to have more resources. NIH has 30 billion US dollars per annum. The MRC has about a, a billion US dollars um, per annum. But I say also that it's not just a matter of resource, not just a matter of money, but also ideas, uh, uh, talent. It's not clear to me that if the, and this might sound like heresy, that if the, the amount of money available for medical research in this country suddenly tripled, which sounds absolutely great, then we'd get three times as much good res research. It's a, it's ideas are a finite capacity um, too. Yes, in 1985, the head of the National Cancer Institute in the US said that um, if they would double his budget, if the Congress would double his budget, then he would halve cancer by the year 2000, and they did, and he didn't. Yeah, question there. <laughs> And then either no more questions after this or one more question at most after this. Uh, Professor Blakemore um, mentioned that there's multiple different complexities and different ways in which cells can degenerate and every single different disease has a sort of different mechanism behind it. And I sort of wanted to hear Aubrey's response to that. Um, so far we've sort of heard that um, stem cell therapy is one way within regenerative medicine that we could combat all of these different diseases. Is that the only thing? We're just sort of going to replace the cell and hope that solves the problem? What, what other possibilities are there? Right, yes, that's certainly not the whole thing. Uh, I think Colin actually mentioned that the standard way in which I describe the science approach is to divide the problem of aging into seven major categories of molecular and cellular damage that accumulate throughout life and eventually contribute to age-related ill health. Now, the complexity that Colin refers to is something that I certainly do not in any way deny. However, something that a lot of people initially have overlooked when encountering the regenerative medicine approach to combating aging is that it very powerfully sidesteps an enormous proportion of our ignorance about the mechanisms of metabolism in the first place and the mechanisms of aging. Essentially, if we can sufficiently comprehensively restore the molecular and cellular composition and structure of the body to how it is at an earlier age in adulthood, then we know that we will also restore its function irrespective of all of those things we don't know about the causal relationships between, the, between metabolism and the damage in question, and also for that matter between the damage in question and the eventual diseases of old age. So this is actually one of the beauties of the regenerative medicine approach. It does help us enormously to sidestep and cut through the complexity that I completely accept exists. Does it exist? I still haven't worked well, that out. So to... I want this covered in your reposts, please. The, um, I the, think uh, yes, I mean, no. can we have one example? Well, I'll give you a new six. example of the application of Would you like me to list the other six? I have a few minutes in my report. No, 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 I'm talking about regenerative <laughs> medicine. What are these new applications? Yeah, do a devastating repost. That'd be good. Do a really <laughs> devastating repost. There's a question here. This is the last question. Well, if it is the last question, I'd hopefully make it a very broad one then. If we ask about the future of ourselves as a species, the human race, and we think about the idea of extending life, and particularly um, Dr. De Grey, what would you say about the fact that we would be slowing down the process of natural selection and of something like evolution, and that our progress as a species, if we were all to live much longer, would be purely based on our own scientific discoveries rather than a faster rate of, say, birth, death, and natural selection and evolution in that way? Well, first of all, I don't see a great deal wrong with our, our changing future being determined in that way rather than by natural selection. Also, I think it's important to remember that natural selection is currently going much faster than it ever did because we are changing the environment in which it occurs through the development of medicine, for example, that makes it more survivable to have a weak immune system. Uh, furthermore, as we develop increasingly safe and increasingly effective gene therapy, we, become, we get into the position of people being able to alter their own genetic composition while they're still alive rather than by the age-old way. So there are lots of different ways in which what you just said, I think, probably doesn't really constitute much of a concern. We've certainly got quite strong selective pressure now for inability to use contraceptives. Mm -hmm. um, Colin. Mm -hmm. In response? Well, are we actually interfering with 
the natural progress of natural selection? I think we've already done a lot of that, haven't we? I mean, Aubrey's made the, the, the point the medical interventions, I mean, the way in which we organise our lives um, have, have pretty much interfered with raw natural selective processes. But I, I mean, I don't see that as a problem. It doesn't mean that human beings aren't continuing to evolve, but they're not evolving by Darwinian principles. They're evolving by the ways in which they organize their society and pass on information and have plastic brains and all, all that kind of stuff. I don't we think we need to be too worried about interrupting yeah, just uh, like evolution. DNA took over from RNA billions of years ago. Now Google's going to take over from human brains. Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> OK, now, I think we will come to the time for a riposte from Dr. Aubrey de Grey, followed by a riposte from Professor Colin Blakemore, and summary for the motion and summary against the motion. And I think we, I do want to try to stick with what Aubrey said, which is that we want to talk somewhat, I mean, if you're going to vote for the motion, then it's not like voting for perpetual motion machines. You've got to be voting to say that there is a reasonable plausibility here and we want to go for it. So it's, it's a question of both plausibility and desirability. It's a difficult motion to phrase properly. I don't think that it's very satisfactorily worded. If the speakers want to rephrase it in the coming five minutes plus five minutes, then please do so. Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to stick with the motion as stated, and I'm very happy to address both feasibility and desirability, as I did in my opening remarks. Um, there's been a number of questions which I get the feeling people are not entirely satisfied with the answers I've given to with regard to the nature of regenerative medicine against ageing. As was pointed out, the one that I've focused on so far is the application of stem cell therapies to combat the progressive loss of cells that occurs in certain tissues with ageing. There is also the accumulation of too many cells because of over-proliferation. That is, of course, what cancer is all about, and I don't think we will have very much difficulty all agreeing that cancer is a predominantly age-related phenomenon that we need to fix if we're going to live substantially longer. Uh, the approach that I have been putting forward to combating cancer is quite an elaborate one, involving a variety of stem cell therapies and gene therapies, but I think it's very important to emphasize that the success or failure of this one particular approach to cancer is not the issue here because a number of other approaches to cancer are of course being pursued all the time and most biologists of one flavor or another are reasonably optimistic or at least are sufficiently optimistic about the promise of success of those approaches that they approve of their being funded. Uh, you can have too many cells, the third thing, from having cells not dying when they are supposed to. It turns out that that's important for the immune system. And a number of laboratories around the world are working on getting rid of cells that have lost the ability to respond to pro-apoptotic signals from their environment and that cause various problems in aging. We have the accumulation of mitochondrial mutations. This is an area that has still eluded detailed understanding in terms of how it contributes to aging in mammals, but I think there is still a majority of gerontologists who believe that one way or another it plays quite a big part, and the approach that has been suggested as much as 25 years ago and is now pretty close to fruition, at least in cell culture, is to actually obviate the existence of mitochondrial DNA by putting suitably modified copies of it into the nuclear DNA. This is something that actually is being pursued quite aggressively at Sense Foundation at the moment. We also have the accumulation of simple molecular garbage, such as um, co um, Colin, in fact, mentioned in relation to Huntington's disease. Uh, this happens not only in the brain in particular diseases, but also in, for example, macrophages in the artery wall leading to cardiovascular disease. And it happens in the retina leading to macular degeneration. Uh, we are pursuing an aggressive approach to identify enzymes from other species which can eliminate these various aggregates so as to re rejuvenate the cells that have accumulated them and whose function has deteriorated as a result. The elimination of molecular garbage in the extracellular space is also an issue that I like to enumerate as a separate category because it seems that it's actually a relatively easy thing to address simply by vaccination, by activating the immune system to eliminate it. In many cases we don't know the role that such molecular garbage actually plays in the etiology of certain diseases, but, as I said earlier, that's not something we need to know if we adopt the regenerative approach, because restoring structure does restore function by definition in any machine. 
And finally, there is stiffening of the extracellular matrix, causing hypertension in the elderly, for example, due to cross-linking caused by, predominantly by, reaction of the extracellular matrix proteins with sugars. And here again, there is great progress at the moment in the development of drugs that selectively cleave those cross-links and thereby restore elasticity. All of these things count as regenerative medicine in one form or another because they're all to do with restoring the structure and the composition of tissues or of the whole body to how it was before damage had occurred. Many of them would not be traditionally considered colloquially as part of regenerative medicine, but within any rigid defi rigorous definition of that sort, they certainly should be. I'll just say one minute about desirability. And what, the point I want to come to is one that Colin made a couple of times, which is the issue of selfishness the issue of whether we should actually look to each other and to society in general for guidance as to whether we should actually develop a treatment for aging that really works, or whether it's okay just to look at ourselves. Now, I want to tell you that I don't just look at myself. I'm 48 years old, and so even by my own, apparently, according to Colin, rather over-optimistic estimates, I only have at most a 50-50 chance of benefiting from the technologies that I want to see developed as soon as possible. But I don't really think about that. What I think about is that for every day that my work hastens the defeat of aging, 100,000 people don't have to suffer from the ill health of old age. 100,000 lives are saved, and indeed saved in a much stronger sense than we can talk about today in terms of saving lives, because of course the potential extension of healthy life would be a great deal more. You know, we can talk about the possibility of having to control birth rate so as to match the death rate, you know, is there such a problem with that, even if we did have to do it? Supposing I just wanted to be my own next generation, thank you, and not have kids. What's wrong with me making that choice? What's wrong with you making that choice? And let's face it, we're making that choice already, compared to how we used to be 200 years ago. You know, 200 years ago, people were having several times more kids than they do now, and it was okay because there were most, but so many of them were dying in infancy. But that means that we are denying an awful lot of people, hypothetical people, the right to life. Do we think we're committing a sin doing so? I don't think so. In general, from a societal point of view, sure, we need to consider what society's benefits will be and what society's potential obstacles will be in a post-aging world. But I have yet to hear a case from anyone, including Colin, for not moving forward with this on the basis that the problems we will create would be greater than the problems that we would solve. Thank you, Aubrey. Professor Blakemore. Well, I'll repeat my, uh, my opening statement that I would um, oppose the motion on the grounds of both the feasibility um, and the desirability of achieving the aim of, uh, of eliminating aging completely. I, I'm, I'm still... Um, I'm still overawed with, with um, Aubrey's exuberance and optimism for, for the progress of the areas of research that he describes. I mean, it's, it's, it's one, either he's a very, very good actor or he really does believe it. What he enumerates essentially is a catalogue of all the unsolved problems of, of medicine. We don't quite understand uh, cancer, we don't quite understand Alzheimer's, Huntington's, whatever it is, but we're just in each of them, each of those areas, just on the brink just on the brink of an incredible new solution to it because of the seven categories of disease all being solved. Um, I, I don't see, I mean, this is a very interesting time for medical research, but I don't sense that the community feels that this really is just a pivotal moment when suddenly everything that's in the textbooks as being an uncurable condition is going to be cured by some new, new development, particularly when, as I'm, I tried to give illustrations, one recognizes the reality of the time scale of research research, fundamental research, but even more so um, of applications. Remember, 30 years to develop monoclonal antibodies, 30 years in the best laboratory in, in the world, 20 years of research on Huntington's and still we don't understand what causes it. We know everything about it, but we don't understand how it happens, let alone not having any treatment for it. But you can carry, there are thousands and thousands of conditions where we don't have proper treatments. Is he really saying that the sense approach is going to deliver all of those instantly if he just gets you know, more money from California donors or maybe a grant from NIH, which I'm not sure that Sense Foundation's ever, ever had. So it's really the total unreality of the approach, which is refreshing and exciting, but just very, very um, naive. 
The, sec the second question, though, and I do want to dwell on it a little, little bit, despite Richard's um, concerns about not overemphasizing it, is the consequences if it were to happen. So at the heart of all the major problems of uh, the planet and clim climate change, supply of food, um, water, uh, conflict, uh, is the problem of, of, of the population e explosion. I mean, as we've already heard, there are 350,000 births every day, 150,000 deaths, and maybe 100,000 of those ascribable to the conditions of, of old age. So if the deaths were all eliminated, people would live for a very long time, and the population increase would go from about 70 million, 75 million a year to 100 and whatever, 20 million a year. So every, every 12 years, we'd have a new China you know, in terms of extra, extra people with the burden on energy resources, with the production of CO2, with the supply of water. water. We are going to see water wars very soon with our present population, heading for populations of perhaps 15 billion, 20 billion by even 2050, 2060, if this were to be um, a tree achieved. So Aubrey's response to all of this, well, first of all, is just to say, well, you know, how can you find out whether we can deal with it without letting it happen? Um, that, uh, I, yeah, could be potentially an incredibly dangerous approach to the application of knowledge. Only if it's incredibly plausible. Only if it's incredibly plausible, quite. Aubrey's response is really frightening, sim simplistic. He says, population growth, I mean, go on the website and look at the, the video interview. Population growth will be counterbalanced by women delaying reproduction as the menopause is deferred. You know, a thousand years, so you have one child, a thousand years, you don't, after sort of 750 years, think, wouldn't it be nice to have another baby, a perfect kept having another baby? I think, you know, it's just very hard to, to, to imagine. Treatment to eliminate aging will be made available without, we haven't talked about it. who would get it? I mean, imagine it is discovered. This elixir of life would be as valuable to the person who owned it as people thought the original elixirs of life would, would be. Who would control it? How would it be made available? What astronomical charges would be made for it? He so says that the population said, problem, wouldn't it? He said, uh, "Well, yeah, well, maybe that's that's a, that's a solution." But then, what do you do? You have thousand-year-old masters of the universe. The um, you probably would. the, you wouldn't the, want the, the, dic life the, dic the dic exactly China. exactly would be having a Stalin forever controlling ownership of this amazing product with m millions of ordinary seventy-year-old dying people around them supporting it. It's, it's, so it'll be made available. He says without charge. To the entire population because the benefits will be instantly recognized by all governments as being so so great and there will be huge economic benefits without discussing the sort of pension issues and the work business and all of that because of an increase in the demand for for medical care but what if the miraculous treatment doesn't actually deal with all the other things you know the the, the deafness the age-related macular degeneration the osteoarthritis the obstructive pulmonary disease, all these other, you've got to do them all if you're going to avoid the extra medical costs. If you just create people who live for a thousand years but have all of those things, the cost will escalate beyond comprehension. So, you know, and finally, and finally, you know, the whole question of the economics, it has to be said. I mean, uh, Olshansky has written, no one could have predicted the modern rise in the present rise in human longevity and the consequences of this unanticipated phenomenon on work, retirement, insurance, national economies, health care, government funding for age entitlement programs, pension schemes, all of which have been alarming. Even more worrisome is the fact that the most dramatic impacts of population aging are looming ahead of us. And he's talking about the present position, not a sudden miraculous transformation in the amount of time that people can live on. And we've got to take that seriously. Did anyone see the Torchwood series last year on Miracle Day? considering the potential consequences of there no longer being any death. Um, Stephen Cave, the author of Immortality, The Quest to Live Forever and How It Drives Civilization, wrote, the problem is that our culture is based on our striving for immortality. It shapes what we do what, and what we believe. It's inspired us to found religions, write poems and build cities. If we were immortal, the motor of civilization would sputter and stop. The real question posed by the Torchwood scenario is what would happen to all our death-defying systems if there were no more death? The logical answer is that they'd be superfluous. Um, we have no need for progress or art, faith or fame. Suddenly we'd have nothing to do. Yet in the greatest of ironies, we'd have endless eons in which to do it. So, um, yeah, he's, he's written, Aubrey's written, um, hum death to die is humanity's biggest problem. It isn't Aubrey. 
I'd love to have a few more years personally, but I would count climate change, energy supply, food, water, depletion of resources, accumulation of garbage, nuclear weapons, religious intolerance, racial hatred, armed conflict, conflict Bashir Assad, and uh, Marine Le Pen as bigger problems than my mortality. Well volunteered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm volunteering. Now, in about a minute or so, I'm going to try to get a vote out of all this. Um, I hope that the vote will affect some aspects of practicability and desirability. And, of course, with the one sort of regenerative medicine we do have is, I suppose, having children. It does, you know, how do they finish up so fresh? And I mean, Shakespeare was saying that it's, it's breeding that actually is the way you carry on down through time. He's finished up saying, in nothing against time's scythe can make defence, save breed to brave him when he takes thee hence. Anyway, mind you, Shakespeare just didn't know anything about modern medicine. Um, now, I think we will start with asking for a vote for the eyes. You're allowed to vote with only one of your two arms. So could you please raise your arm very clearly if you want to vote in favour of this motion? Thank you. And could you raise your arm very clearly if you wish to vote against this motion? Thank you very much. I think the motion is rejected by a majority assessed by me, and this debate will be resumed on the 25th of April 2112, either by the survivors of this meeting or by our children. Thank you very much indeed. Now, one thing that is even more, one thing that does achieve longevity is companies, institutions, states, and most important of all, scientific societies. But scientific societies achieve immortality only if they can pay their bills. And this building cost us £837 to rent this evening. So please, as you walk out, drop something voluntarily into some of the black buckets. But if you don't, that's fine. But please do.